on this, the sixth Sunday of Easter. We begin this morning's service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom, whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Before we move into the service, we're going to pray our coronavirus prayer that we've done every week for the last six or seven weeks. The Lord be with you, and also, and also with, with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, give us grace to trust in you during this time of illness and national distress. In mercy, put an end to this coronavirus pandemic. Grant relief to all who suffer with this disease and comfort those who mourn. Sustain all medical personnel and first responders in their labors and cause your people to ever serve you in righteousness and holiness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and, and also, also with you. you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who are gathered here to worship and pray, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray the prayer of the day printed in your today's readings bulletin insert. Follow along and pray along. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hold together all things in heaven and on earth. In your great mercy, receive the prayers of all of your children and give to all the world the spirit of your truth and peace through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Will the congregation please turn to our first reading of the day, and it's going to be the text for today's sermon, so pay careful attention as I read this to you. Follow along in your today's reading bulletin insert or your Holy Bible. A reading from Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city, and look carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with an inscription, and it read, To an unknown God. 
What therefore you worship as unknown, I shall proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines or temples made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, that's Adam, he made all nations inhabit the whole earth. And God allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity, this deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by an artist or by the imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead, the resurrection of the dead. Here ends the first reading for today. The second reading for today is taken from Peter's first epistle, chapter three, beginning with verse 13. Again, follow along. St. Peter writes, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands you an accounting for the hope that, that you have. Yet do it with gentleness and with reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer by doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water and baptism, which, is, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from your body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers made subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will the congregation please turn to our appointed gospel lesson for today, taken from the gospel of St. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 15. Again, follow along. Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, a comforter, to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will also be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while... The world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I am in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on the sixth Sunday of Easter, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here at St. Paul's outdoors at our drive-in service. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, the freedom, and the privilege to gather and to hear the proclamation of your word and to receive the Holy Sacrament. Lord, open our hearts and minds today as we prepare to talk about our first reading from Acts chapter 17. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now, if you look around, you'll notice we're sitting in the parking lot of a church called St. Paul's Lutheran Church. You know, you can never know too much about St. Paul. We like the New Testament, 27 books. Of that, 13 books of the New Testament are written by St. Paul. Now, St. Paul is a remarkable individual in that he's a Pharisee, trained at the feet of Gamaliel. That means he went to Harvard or Princeton or Yale of that day. He's an expert in the Jewish law, and he's very zealous for his faith. Remember his conversion story? He gets special papers from the religious leaders in Jerusalem to go to Damascus 110 miles away. These are arrest warrants. He's going to round up the Christians, the heretics, and he's going to put them in chains and bring them back to Jerusalem so they can be killed. I don't know about you, but that's the hallmark of a lunatic and a fanatic. You know, I wouldn't say, oh, Methodists, they get, I can't stand them. I'm going to get a search warrant and I'm going to go 100 miles away. I'm going to walk there, in fact, so I can round them up and bring them back here and put them on trial until they have the right opinion, which is my opinion. That's a lunatic. So what happens to Paul? He goes on this Damascus road. Jesus appears to him. He knocks him off the horse. He's blind for three days. How many days? Three days. And on the other side, he's a new man. God chose and selected Saul to become St. Paul. What is this guy? He speaks Aramaic. That's the language of this area. Jesus spoke Aramaic. He reads Hebrew because he's highly educated. He's a Pharisee. He knows the Torah. He probably knows Koine Greek. That's the lingua franca of the eastern half of the Roman Empire. He probably speaks Latin. That's at least four languages. He probably picked up a few other regional languages in his travels. He's the one that took the gospel, not from Jerusalem, he starts there, but he takes the gospel all the way through the eastern half of the Roman Empire. And by the time you read the book of Acts, where is Paul? He's on his way to Rome. So how did the gospel go from Jerusalem, a small group of apostles gathered in the upper room, to an international religion? Paul is the man that did it. Paul is the guy. He's the mover and the shaker. Now, Paul has a very distinguished resume. He has three travels, three trips of Paul. Out of all the th adventures he had, he had many, many adventures. He's shipwrecked. He's snake bitten. He's uh, he's uh, per lowered over, over uh, on the basket, lowered in a basket over the city walls because they're trying to kill him. He, all kinds of things happen to this guy. He would say, you know what? One of the highlights of my career, the highlight of my life is this, Acts chapter 17, today's first reading. What do you mean? Look, in the Roman Empire, you've heard the saying, all roads lead to Rome. The Romans built 58,000 miles of roads that connect the whole you know, Mediterranean region together. Now, Rome is the political capital of the Roman Empire. That's where the Roman emperors are. But the philosophical and the religious, the cultural center of the Roman Empire is Athens. Athens, Greece. You know, I've, I haven't been to Greece. I'd like to go there someday. The Acropolis, you know. Well, the Acropolis is where the Parthenon is located. And it's the, cent it's the place where Aristotle and Plato are from. It's the place where Zeno is from. It's the home of Stoic and Epicurean philosophy. In other words, this is like the, it's like Boston or something, going to Cambridge or Harvard, you know, it's, it's a place like this. It's a cultural center for the ancient world. Now, Athens at this time, it's around 51 AD, remember? 33 AD is a date we do use for the death, resurrection, resurrection of Christ. 18 years later, Paul is in Athens, and he, he has a, a rare opportunity to testify, to speak, to speak to who? 
Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. Read, take your Bible and read the verses that are just above this one for today. What's an Epicurean? To make it easy and make it short, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's the, 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 the materialist people. And Stoic people are like Mr. Spock in Star Trek. You know, the world is messed up, the world is broken, and you're supposed to endure the world and don't show any emotion, just do your time, and that's the end. That's the Stoic philosophy. By 51 AD, the old-time religion, the old-time religion in the Greek world are the Greek pantheon of gods. Remember, here's my notebook here. Remember back in the 8th grade, they made you take and study about the Greco-Roman gods? Remember that one? You probably had that. And there are 15 principal gods, 15 principal gods. And if you go to Athens, there are 30,000 gods or more in Athens. Well, why is that? What does that mean? Well, let's look at the text here. So Paul stands up in front of the Areopagus. What is that supposed to mean? That's a word I don't know. In your bulletin insert today, I put a vocabulary list so you can know what I'm talking about today. So take that home and look at that. Stick it in your Bible, in fact. Areopagus means Mars Hill or the Hill of Ares. Ares is the god of war in Greek mythology. Mars is the god of war in Roman mythology. So he's at Mars Hill. What is this? It's a real place, a real location. Again, if you go on a tour, if you go to Greece, they will take you to a place and they'll say, this is the Areopagus. This is Mars Hill. What is it? It's a place where the council, the city council meets. It's a town hall. And it's also a place where if there's a murder trial, Hamilton Berger and Perry Mason appear there to try the case. It's also a place where if there's a new speaker in town or somebody with a new idea, they're invited to come to the Areopagus and sit in front of all the philosophers the high point of human wisdom in the ancient world, and you're allowed to present your material. You think Paul is excited to be here today? This is the highlight of his life. He gets, this is the big time. This is like, you're in double A baseball and you're invited to pitch in Yankee Stadium on World Series, the first game. Yeah, I'd do it. That's what Paul's doing right here. So he's at the Areopagus and he's standing there. And what does he do? He doesn't start off by going, you're a bunch of morons, you're a bunch of idiots, he doesn't call them names. No, when you do classical rhetoric, you have to win the crowd over. You say something like, this is the best looking congregation I've ever seen. Of course, I can't see you because your windows are tinted, but I know you're beautiful people. That's what you do, you win over the love of the crowd, and then you lay out your argument. So this is what he does, he goes, Athenians, stop. Again, Athens is the top of the game in the academic world, right? It's the cultural, philosophical center of the Roman Empire. So to be a citizen of Athens is a huge deal. They're, they have a lot of pride in their city. They know that the Romans might be tougher on the battlefield, and they conquered us, but you know what? When it comes to the mind, we're number one, Athenians. Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. Now, is that a compliment? Uh, no, that's, that's a snarkism. That's snarky. The word is, you've heard of uh, the kid named, a uh, boy named Damien, okay? Damien is, is, if you spit it on the evil side, it's demon. Damien, in the ancient world, they believe the world is inhabited with Damien's, like little spirits all over the place. So there's like spirits over there by that pine tree. There's one in this tree over here. There's some over here in the, you know, over the ground over here. They're all over the place. So when he says, you're very religious, he says, you are Damien-fearing people. In other words, the ancient religion is not based on God loves you. It's based on you're afraid of the gods. You're afraid of the dark. You see, when you don't believe anything, you'll believe anything. So you become very superstitious. And they're worried about their spirits out here all over the place. There's Damien's all over the place. And, oh, we're afraid. You're very religious. What do you mean you're religious? The place is covered. 30,000 gods, little temples, little shrines all over the place. 
You know, I've been to India three times. I love India. But when you go to India, 80% of the population in India are Hindu. How many gods in Hinduism? 330 million gods in Hinduism. It's called polytheism. Poly means many. Theos, many gods. 330 million gods. When you go to India, there's a shrine here, a shrine there, a temple here, a temple here. Wherever you go. I actually went into a Hindu temple with my friend, Dr. Paul Rajan. It's an unbelievable, amazing thing. It's this gigantic edifice. And there's guys with like towels wrapped around them, no shirts on. They have like paint on there. And they're like burning candles and putting leaves and putting bananas out. They're very religious. Very religious. They're working the program. They're very religious. Well, that's what Athens looks like. You see, Hinduism has an affinity with the ancient Greek, Greco-Roman religion. So if you know about the ancient Greek gods, you can like make the jump into Hinduism. It's very, very similar. He looks around and he says, oh, you're very religious. I walk through your city and, and I, what do I see? Objects of your worship. Stop. I have a question for you. Take out your copy of Luther's small catechism that I gave you last week. And if you don't have one, I'll give you another one this week on the way out. The Ten Commandments. The first commandment is what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. No graven images. Now, who's Paul? He's a Jew. Does Paul know the Ten Commandments? Are you kidding me? When he walks through the streets of Athens, his blood pressure goes like this. He's boiling up things. His head is about to explode. Why? Because he sees graven images idols here idols here idols here idols here, all over the place idols all over the place and he sees this and he he's like he can't figure this out this is supposed to be athens you're supposed to be very sophisticated you're supposed to know you're supposed to know about things and instead you are stuck in this ancient system this ancient polytheistic system now stop for a minute Thirty thousand gods does this apply to us today? Oh yeah, it applies to us today. Why? Jews and Christians, that's us. We are called theistic people. That means we believe in the creator-creation dichotomy. What does that mean? We believe that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and we are his creatures, and this is the creation. We worship what? This way only. We worship the creator only. Worship this way only. Pantheism, polytheism, worships the creation. That's a problem. That's idol worship. So do we have this today? Oh yeah, we have it today. You've heard of the God of uh, the Syrian God, Mammon? You cannot love God and Mammon at the same time. Who is Mammon? He's a Syrian demon. He's greedy. He's the God of wealth and riches. I used to worship mammon until the coronavirus hit and wiped out my portfolio. So now I don't believe that anymore. No, isn't that amazing? How is it possible? We spent our whole life building up our retirement. Building. All of a sudden, one little virus comes from China, you know, 60 days ago, and we're all standing in line for toilet paper. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's an unbelievable thing. So mammon and riches. There are some people that have spent the whole life amassing riches. They love money. They love And what happens to them? It's not a happy ending. Right? So do we believe in mammon? Oh, a lot of people believe in mammon. How about this one? Bacchus. Who is that? Bacchus is the god of wine and alcohol and drugs. Yeah, that's the 1960s for you. They want to have a chemically induced mystical experience because coming to church is boring. So they want to induce a mystical experience and see the gods on their own. That's what they did. A bacchanalia is where you drink so much until you see the gods. Do we have a lot of that? Yeah, yeah. We, the leading problem in prisons today, maybe 60, 70, 80% of the inmates are in there because of drug and alcohol problems. We have a national drug and alcohol problem. What is alcohol? It's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem. Yeah, we have Bacchus here. How about Athena, the goddess of wisdom? Oh, yeah. Athens is named after the goddess of wisdom. Do we have that today? Yeah. We put people with PhDs up on a pedestal. And if they're, if they're good at one particular subject, we think they have the ability to speak a pontificate about all human activities. 
Sometimes their models aren't right. Sometimes their models are based on extrapolations. Sometimes they just make stuff up because they like to be on TV. We worship wisdom, and what happens to us? It doesn't work well. Don't forget, many of Hitler's top henchmen had advanced degrees. Remember, Joseph Goebbels has two doctorates, Dr. Dr. Joseph Goebbels. So wisdom is not necessarily the, a good thing. How about Athena, the goddess of love? Oh yeah, that's what Hollywood's all based on, lust and beauty. What happens to you when you confuse lust and love? Well, it's a bad thing. It doesn't end nicely. The I, okay? How about Mars? Mars is the goddess of god of war. Do we have a problem with that? Yeah, terrorism, political power, political clout. We worship Mars. How about Hercules? Yeah, everybody's upset now because all the health clubs are closed. Yeah, you can't go to IXL. You have to come to the drive-in church instead on Sunday morning. We worship health. We worship strength. Hercules is one of our gods. Apollo and Pan are the gods of music. They appeal to the ear, right? So do we have this stuff? We look back at the Greeks and go, well, what a bunch of morons. Who would believe that? Well, you believe it. You believe it, except we don't call it by the names that they did. They're a little more honest than we are. We just say, oh, no, I'm interested in health and working out a lot. Yeah, you're a Hercules worshiper. All right, so here we go then. So he looks around, and here's the problem with pantheism and polytheism. How do you know you got the right God? Remember what ancient worship is worth is based on? The gods live on Mount Olympus, and they don't care about mortal. Mortals are people that you use and abuse. Humans have no human rights. You're a nothing. You're an object to be toyed with by the gods. You're squashed like a bug, and no one laments your passing. So... How, and what, so what is it based on? You have to appease the ancient gods if you're going to go somewhere. Again, the classic example would be, I'm going on a Caribbean cruise. Okay, what do you do? You go to the Temple of Poseidon, and you make a sacrifice because the gods love the smell of fresh blood, and they love barbecue. They love smoke burning. So Poseidon's attention is attracted to the temple where the blood and the smoke is, and then you can sneak away and go on your Caribbean cruise and be safe. If the gods notice you, they're going to come and get you and bad things are going to happen to you. So you want to create a diversion by sacrificing in the temples of all these gods. There's 30,000 gods, so what do you do? How do you know you got the right god? If something bad happens to you, they'll say something like this. Why did you get the coronavirus? You didn't sacrifice to the right god. There's a coronavirus god, and you have to appease that god, or you'll get punished. That's how they think. So, what do you do? You have the miscellaneous category. So, they've actually found altars like this in the, uh, in the eastern half of the Roman Empire. There's hundreds of them. They're an altar, and it says on it, to an unknown god. Right? I put that in your bulletin there, the Greek. Right? Theos is god. Um, you've heard of agnostic. Right? Ah means no. Gnosis means no, you don't know. So, ag agnosis means unknown God. Why is that important? Well, that's the miscellaneous category to make sure you appeased all the gods. You don't want to offend any of the gods. So Paul sees that altar and he goes, I noticed all of your altars and I also noticed this one, the unknown God. Paul uses that as a connection point. This is called apologetics, defense of the Christian religion. If he was speaking to a Jewish audience, he would say, here's the Bible. Let's go through the Old Testament, 333 Old Testament prophecies that point to Jesus. Well, guess what? He's talking to pagans. He's talking to polytheists. He's talking to people that don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know. Never heard of Moses before. Never heard of Noah. Never heard of Jeremiah. So what does he do? He meets them where they are and takes them up to where they need to be. Stop. Where did he learn that from? That's what Jesus does. When he meets people, he meets them where they are and takes them up to where they need to be. That's what Paul's doing here. Where, what's the common connection point? He doesn't start with the things they disagree with. You're a bunch of polytheistic, you know, nature worship. No, he doesn't say that. He goes, you, you worship, you have an altar for this unknown God. Let me tell you something that you don't know. Stop. Where are they in Athens? Who are they talking to? Philosophers. What do philosophers know? Philosophers know everything because they have PhDs. 
can you convince someone that has a PhD that maybe 40 years of study that they're wrong and maybe they need to change their view? Good luck to that one. Right? So when he says to them, well, I'm, let me tell you something you don't know. I'm going to tell you about this unknown God. And who is the unknown God? The unknown God is the God that is revealed in the pages of the Holy Scripture. In the beginning, God, the ineffable name of God is Yahweh. Let me tell you about that God. The unknown God is the God that we proclaim. This is the God that did what? Made the heaven and the earth. The creator. If you read pagan myths, Greco-Roman myths, pagan myths, the creation is caused by sex and violence. The earth is born out of chaos. Our God creates the world out of nothing by speaking the word and the word became flesh. He speaks the word and the creation is created. Our God, he doesn't live in shrines. He doesn't live in temples. What is it about what is it about pagan shrines of pagan temples? It's a way of you putting God in a box. If you can control Poseidon, he's a dangerous guy. You put him in a box. There, you can offer blood sacrifices and burn things on the altar. You control the God. No, our God controls the entire cosmos. You can't put God in a box. That's why, you know, I think God's kind of smiling here, right? We're sitting out in the parking lot. Is God out here? Where two or more are gathered in his name, God is present. He doesn't need a fancy, we have a pretty nice building here, don't we? You know what? God doesn't need a building, right? God, God is where two or more are gathered in his name. I like, I'm glad we have a nice old building, but we don't really need a building. Because God is bigger than any building we can build. He's bigger than St. Patrick's Cathedral. Think about that. Go to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine and walk around. That's a pretty impressive building. Guess what? God is bigger than that. So God doesn't depend on buildings and shrines. He does. Why? Because these buildings are made by human hands. Think about that for a minute. How stupid is idol worship? I'm going to make a statue, and it's going to be God, and I'm going to put gold and silver on it, and maybe I'll carve out a marble, and I'll put it in a fancy building. That's God. Well, the God is made by human hands. That's ridiculous. Our God created human hands. We don't create the gods. Extremely important. And what is this? God himself gives all mortals life and breathes on them. Adam, Adam means dirt man. God created Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathed rock. He breathed life into Adam. That's our God. From one ancestor. Who's the one ancestor? Adam. From Adam, he made all nations inhabit the whole earth. Ready? What do the Greeks think? The Greeks think there's two kinds of people in the world. There's Greeks and there's barbarians. Barbarians are non-persons. Out of the Nazis, they say there's Aryans and there's Untermensch people. There's non-persons. What do you do with non-persons? You kill them. You will use them, you abuse them, because they're non-persons. They don't have any human rights. Only the chosen people, only the Aryans or the Greeks have rights. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying, guess what? Our God created all human beings. And if you don't like the Adam and Eve story, read the story of Noah. Noah has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In the reading today, our second reading from St. Peter, it says... There were eight people on the ark. Who were they? Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives. The wives aren't named. So what does that mean? Shem is the father of Asians. Japheth is the father of Europeans. Ham is the father of Africans. All men are brothers. You cannot be a racist and call yourself a Jew or a Christian. You cannot read this book and say, oh, I'm a racist. That's what Paul is saying here. There is no... God is the God of all human beings. All men are created equal. That's what he's saying here. From one ancestor, he made, and these nations inhabited the whole earth. In other words, it isn't just the Roman, the Roman Empire. It isn't just the British Empire. God is the Lord of all people. Seven billion people in the world today. And his heart is broken with the coronavirus sweeping through the world. 
And he allotted what? The times of their existence and the boundaries. What does that mean? God is the God of history. How do you spell history? His story. You read the Bible, you start at the beginning and read all the way to Revelation, and then keep reading a history shelf. Start reading about European history, American history, Egyptian history. Guess what? It all leads to God is on the throne and God is sovereign. The nations rise, the nations fall. The Roman Empire, it was a big deal for 1,500 years. It's now a memory for archaeologists. The British Empire, in 1914, they controlled 25% of the world population. Guess what? They went down. Today, the world's leading superpower is the United States. Are we always going to be the leading superpower? I like the United States. I hope we are. But from reading history, nations come and go. They rise and fall. China, they think they should be the world's leading empire right now. Well, guess what? God is above all empires from all time that have ever lived. The nations rise, the boundaries, nations change all the time. And what, what about these nations of the world? So that they, they, God wants, the purpose of history is for you to say, how do we explain this? What is the meaning of life? What is this? When you read history, I think the big lesson of history is that we cannot govern ourselves. The 20th century, we killed 140 to 430 million people in gulags, death camps, wars, revolutions. It's the bloodiest century of human history. The 20th century. Yeah, but aren't we sophisticated and civilized? Don't we have science and philosophy? Yeah, we use our science and philosophy to slaughter our fellows. And then we say that we're a wonderful people. Think about that. Well, guess what? God is on the throne and when you come to the end of the line and you've tried every political system and every philosophy and you've tried Bacchus and you've tried every God you can think of guess what God is standing there and he says you should have come to me first that's the lesson of history and we grope I love that word we grope we're groping through life we're groping through what is the solution to our problem what are we gonna do if we only elected the right person, all of our problems would be solved. Is that true? No. Your problem is not a political problem. Your problem is a spiritual problem, a heart problem. And God says, come to me. Come to me. Believe in me. You're groping. You're looking. You're searching. I've tried this God. I've tried that God. I've tried money. I've tried Bacchus. I've tried Aphrodite. I've tried Mars. Guess what? At the end of the line, all these are all false gods. They're all bankrupt and they lead to death and destruction. These gods want you dead because they, these gods think that you are a non-person. You're a nothing, you don't matter. The Christian religion is radically different. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Do you think in the Greco-Roman philosophy that the gods, the 15 gods of a mountain, would come down and they would die on the cross to save the mortals, save human beings? No, mortals are nothing. In the pagan world, in the Christian religion, you are created, what? In the image and likeness of God. God loves you, you soul, your life. You have infinite value and worth. You are not a non-person, you are not a non-thing. God loved you so much that he came down on earth and died for you. Think about that for a minute. That's what Paul is telling these people. And you're groping with your philosophy. You're groping with your idols. You're groping with your empty lives. And then you turn around and wonder what the problem is. The problem is you don't have God in your life. Paul says, that God that you're looking for, that God that you're seeking, that God, guess what? He's right here. Right here on the pages of the Holy Bible. That's who this God is. And we, who are we? We're his offspring. We're not us. You can't, you can't be in a temple. And what is this? What is it all about? This is the, here's the conclusion of this. This God has fixed a day and a time when the world is going to be judged. What do you mean? You're not the judge of me. I'm do, I, no respect. I do whatever I want. Yeah, that's why your life is a, is a wreck. God gave us a standard. The standard is start with the Ten Commandments and keep reading after that. That's how God wants you to live. He wants you to live a righteous and a good life, a pure life that honors God. 
He wants you to repent, to turn your life around. If you say to these pagans, you say to these people, do you need to, I'm, not, I'm a good person, I don't really need to repent. We all need to repent. All have sinned and fallen short of what God wants you to do. You know that. You know that it's true. God wants you to repent. God wants you to come back to Him. He wants you to turn your life around. And one day, He's going to judge. He's going to judge the world. And He gives us assurance of what? We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. You believe in Christ. Now, at Judgment Day, there's only one question. It's not, did you appease the gods? How much money did you make? No, the question is this. Do you believe in Jesus or not? The answer is yes. I believe in Jesus. And because of him, you will have eternal life. We are saved by his name. We are saved by the name of Jesus. And who is this person? The DBR again. Remember the five points for the life of Christ? The birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ. The DBR, the death, burial, resurrection. He died on the cross. He was buried in the third day. He rose again. He defeated sin and death. Now, what happened? When Paul said the resurrection of the dead, that's a choking point. You see, the preaching of the cross is a stumbling block to people. They, 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 they can't stand that. So, these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, what was their reaction? If you keep reading, keep reading. You start with uh, verse 32 and keep going down. The reaction, there's two reactions. The first reaction is this. Snarky, let's make fun of them, let's mock them. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Oh, anyone who could believe in the Holy Bible, anyone who could believe in Jesus, oh, what an illiterate moron. I love it when I watch the news because I see whenever they show Christians on TV, who are they? Usually it's some Pentecostal group that does snake handling or something. They have their hands up in the air. They never come and talk to someone like us. They always talk to some you know, extreme manifestation, and that's typical of all Christians. Or my favorite, there's a pickup truck, and it says on the side, written in like a white marker, it says, Jesus is my vaccination. That drives people crazy. It drives them crazy, right? But we're rational, and we believe in... So these people, they mocked Christ. They mock Paul's method. They think that's really funny. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Why? Because they have their philosophy. You're not saved by philosophy. You're saved by faith in Christ. So they mocked him. The second reaction is this. They said, well, thank you for your interesting discussion, Paul. Thank you for being in town. If you ever, here's my card. In case you ever come back to town, please stop in again. In other words, they're being nice to him. But do they really think about it? Do they really hear what he has to say? Not really. It goes in one ear and out the other. They're just being polite. And they're delaying it. Now is the acceptable time of the Lord. You don't know how much time you have. Now is the time to say, I believe in Christ. Now's the time. Don't delay it. So they go, snark. That's one. Two. Oh, we'll, come, come, we'll think about it another time. Well, was this sermon a complete waste of time for Paul? The answer is no. In the book of Acts, in the New Testament in general, it's always a mixed response, even with Jesus preaching. Some people believe it and some people don't. Why is it that people don't believe? I don't know. But I do know about people that do believe. People that do believe have their lives transformed. Once I was lost and now I am found. That's what Christ does. He transforms lives. He transformed two lives here in the book of Acts. Dionysius the Areopagite, that's his name. Do we know anything about him? No, we don't know anything about him, other than he was one of the converts. He evidently was a member of the council, high-ranking official. And there was another woman that was there, and she was also converted along with a few other people. So this is what Paul does. He goes, he bears testimony. Notice, he doesn't back down. He doesn't wimp out his message. He doesn't tone it down. He doesn't make it less offensive so he don't hurt feelings. He stands his ground and he takes on paganism, polytheism. And he says, it's empty to worship idols. It's foolishness to worship idols. Worship the one true God. Believe in our creator Believe in the word who made flesh. Believe in Jesus who came down and died on the cross for you. 
This is one of the highlights of Paul's entire career. And I hope you read this over and think about this today because it's a true blessing. Focus on the risen Lord, focused on Christ. Amen. Amen. Dear. 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 Come here. Come here. Oh, good. Oh, okay, good. Oops. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. The response is, your mercy is great. Before we begin our prayer, uh, Helen Dykeman is in the house today. Of course, I wouldn't know because she's in a car here somewhere. Pete, honk the horn. He probably fell asleep. Helen's here somewhere. Oh, there she is. God bless you, Helen Dykeman. She's been in the hospital a long time, and we're glad to have her back. Yeah. Let us pray. Made alive in Christ and filled with his spirit, let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all of God's creation. O oh God, you abide with your church. Empower us with your Holy Spirit so that your people may speak and live the love revealed in Jesus. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. You abide with your creation. O oh God, breathe on the fields and the forests, the lakes and the oceans, and all living creatures, so that they may thrive as you intend. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You abide with the nations, O oh God. Reveal your truth, so that nations and peoples may govern in peace and advocate for justice. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You abide with the needy, O Lord. Cheer the sorrowful. Protect the orphan. Support the grieving. And heal the sick. Lord, today, especially, we lift up before you all of the people listed on our prayer list today. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You abide with the fearful, O oh God. Transform fear into freedom for the life that Christ has promised. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We remember, O oh God, those who have died today in faith. Assure us that your life-giving spirit will be with us until the day when we are able to be with you forever. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Receive our prayers, merciful God, and dwell in us richly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. amen. If you have your small catechism with you, take it out, or it's also in the bulletin insert. Join with me in saying the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share the peace of Christ. be with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them unto the Lord let us, let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right to give him thanks and praise
Hear now the words of institution. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the remission of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Join with me now in praying the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. Partake. The blood of Christ shed for you. Partake. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Pour out your spirit of love upon us, O Lord. And unite, the those, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with this heavenly food. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.